Resurrection Sunday, everybody. It's this time of celebration. Welcome to New Heights Baptist Church. We're glad to see everybody here this morning. If you would stand with me and take your hymnals, turn to page 161. Page 161 in your hymnals. We'll sing Hallelujah, What a Savior. Page 161, we'll sing the first, the second, the fourth, and fifth verses. Page 161 in your hymnals. Sing it out your best this morning. Man of sorrows, what a name, for a son of God he came, willing sinners to reclaim, hallelujah, what a Savior, bearing shame. song. Please remain standing now for scripture reading. This morning's scripture is from the book of 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 6 through 11. 1 Peter 5 6 through 11. Jesus is near. Jesus is true. Jesus is strong. He is my all for all my sorrow giving a song. So, 1 Peter 5, we begin in verse 6 through 11. As we begin, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil has a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good to see a lot of visitors with us today. We want to make you feel welcome, so we're glad you're here and Amen. pray that uh, you'll be blessed because of it. Amen. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father in heaven, as we gather in this place once again, we come, Father, to worship you on this Resurrection Sunday. And the things we've heard already remind us of what Jesus has done for the world by giving himself as a sacrifice for the sins of the world, we might have salvation through him, through his death on the cross, bearing our sins, through his burial, but most important, Father, through the resurrection. We ask, Father, that you would bless us and use us for your glory and your honor because of it. Bless those that are here, Lord, that you would feed them from your word, give them the things that they need to hear, to draw them closer to you. Bless our pastors, he brings the word. Bless our servants who serve here, 
Lord, give them more faith that they might serve you more. And our visitors, we pray, Father, that you would bless them for being with us today and make them feel welcome. In Christ's Amen. name we ask. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated.
Amen. If you would stand with me again and take your hymnals, page 185, we'll sing, Christ arose, low in the grave he lay, Jesus my Savior. Sing all three verses. I love that song the choir just sang, No More. Great song. Page 185 in your hymnals, sing all three verses. Low in the grave he singing. You may be seated.
All right, if you would all stand and take your hymnals one last time, turn to page 182. Page 182. Sing all three verses of Because He Lives. God sent His Son. Page 182. Y'all doing a great job singing this morning. Keep it going on this first verse. God sent His Son. They called Him Jesus. He came to said, Pastor, you just don't know. I own several businesses. I have been blessed, and I am a wealthy man. Yes, sir, you sure are, but you're going to die. What about after that? Someone says, well, I have so many degrees that I have earned. I have so many honors that's been attached to my name. That's good, but you're going to die. What about after that? Someone says, well, I have worked so hard, I have built a business, and I came from shoestrings up, man. That's great. That's wonderful. We celebrate such. But you're going to die. 
The Bible says it's appointed that a man wants to die, and after this, the judgment. And sure as there's a sun and a moon, you better be, better be ready for that judgment. You may think it's not coming, but if you just knew half of the prophecies that are being fulfilled right in front of your nose that were given hundreds and thousands of years before, you wouldn't be quite so easy to mock. Amen? Amen. We are seeing so many things unravel and take place according to Bible prophecy that were foretold not 10 years ago. We're not talking about some little seminar. We're talking about the everlasting word of God. And sir and ma'am, we better be ready because the Lord could return at any time, perhaps today, perhaps today. The rapture would take place. Would you go with the Lord or would you left, be left behind to have to deal with the tribulation? That's coming. Where's the sign? Mock, mock all you want, but it's coming. Lord, help us to be ready. Let's pray. Father of heaven, thank you, Father, for this beautiful day. You've given us to worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, I pray that today would matter for all eternity, for every man, every woman, every boy and girl here today. Lord, we're not here to entertain anyone. We're not here to joke or just have a good time. We're here to worship you. We're here to worship the one who rose from the dead to secure our salvation. For every man, every woman, every boy and girl on the planet ever to be could know the wonderful gift of eternal life in Jesus Christ and be forgiven of all of our sin because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. So honor you, Lord, we will. And humbly so. And Lord, we ask that you would bless us today, that you'd give us the good sense to open our mouth wide and receive the good things of God. The truth, the truth, the truth of God. And the truth is the only thing that brings freedom. Lord, we live in such a confused world. We can't even have a justice to find what a woman is. Lord, I pray that you would help us and give us the simplicity that is found in the Lord Jesus Christ and understanding that's only found in your word. Thy word is truth. Amen. So Father, I pray that you'd bless members and guests here that have honored this place and come here today. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to see Jesus today. Lord, and not some flippant, just pop way, but in truth, in truth. And I pray that you'd bless us the people of God, and those perhaps are not now the people of God, but even maybe this day would become a child of God through faith, putting their personal faith and trust in Jesus Christ. So, Lord, we pray that you'd bless our people as we give, and we worship you in giving, and bless this time together in your holy word. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Well, the other day, our young adults uh, sang a song for us in this ensemble. It was such a blessing. I asked if we could uh, have them sing it again this, uh, this Sunday morning. And um, they're going to come and sing, and I think it will be a blessing to you. God bless you. After a series, you know, we've been preaching, and uh, man, that missed it just by one Sunday. And uh, I just 
you know, thought, man alive, I just needed to tag on one more sermon, you know, for that. But we, last week we started our mission emphasis. We carried the mission emphasis usually uh, three to five weeks. And uh, this particular year, uh, Easter kind of fell right in the middle of it. So last week we actually started our mission conference, our mission emphasis uh, for the month. In our church, we support missionaries. We support preachers to go around the world preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and establishing New Testament churches just like this one. We do that, and we do that religiously. We do that faithfully. We do that enthusiastically. Amen. We give money. Whew, money, yes, money. We give money. The gospel's free, but it takes a lot of money to pipe it around the world. And to get people in places, if you're going to fly to Europe, God bless you, but it's going to cost you a penny or two. If you're going to fly to South Africa, it's going to cost you a penny or two. If you're going to fly to Japan, it's going to cost you a lot more than a few pennies. Then it does our missionaries as well. But we've been faithfully engaged in doing the work of God that Jesus Christ commanded us to do, His church. That's why we do what we do, is we are simply being obedient to God and obedient to God's word. You so say, you really believe all this? Yes. Yes. I had a, a Muslim man ask me one day who escaped from his country and came to America. And he asked me, he says, do you really believe this? And I said, yes. He said, no, do you really? And I said, what you're asking is, would you be willing to die for this? He said, yes. Yes, I believe. You're looking at a true blue believer. I believe in Jesus. And I believe that you should too. And I don't apologize that for not one second. Because I know the best thing you could ever do in your personal life is put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. I would like to invite your attention to one of the best sermons that's ever been preached in all of the world. And my regret, it's not one of mine. <laughs> it's not one of mine. Acts chapter 13, if you do not have a Bible with you, you should find one, a, a pew Bible there before you, and you can even have that as our gift if you need a Bible. You can have that, or if you have a friend or a neighbor that does not have a copy of God's Word, you are invited to take that and grant them a gift from yourself and from us to them this wonderful day. It is found, of course, in Acts chapter 13. The sermon, of course, comes from a man who is a devout Pharisee. That was the religious kind of zealots of that day. Trained by the top scholars, skilled in perhaps seven different languages. I have difficulty enough with one. But he was a murderer. He was a murderer. But he, thinking, he was thinking he was doing God a favor because he was persecuting Christians. And they were those he felt, felt were the enemies of Judaism. But one day on the road to a city by the name of Damascus, he had an encounter with God. And God struck him blind, saved him, changed him forever. He was already skilled, very skilled, highly skilled in the Old Testament. So it began preaching, but this time not against Christ, but for Christ. He was an enemy of, to God and God's people, and they were scared to death of him. Many, though, thought because of this conversion, they thought maybe he's just playing a trick and that would not be above those in that day and even those today who are playing games to play tricks and expose the Christians to get them to trust him so that he could put them in jail and abuse them and squash this movement called the way. But there was a man by the name of Barnabas who took this man into his fellowship and trusted him and became a cheerleader, of course, to God's word and helped him and vouched for him and helped him with the great change that, it, that God had brought in his life. Now Barnabas teamed up with this man named Paul and the two of them, they've gone back here now to Antioch and from there God sent them out of this church, a church just like this one. 
He sent them out of this church to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. To start churches just like this one. This is where we came from. It's where we came from. They went west out into the Mediterranean Sea, out into the island known as Cyprus. By the way, it's the hometown of this Barnabas. Then up and over into Asia Minor, up about 100 miles inland, crossing two very dangerous rivers into very rough mountainous areas, probably where the Apostle Paul was exposed to robbers and thieves. Very rough area. Many people through the years had a hard time in this area. And of course he later wrote about this in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty six. This very mountainous area is much like what Bin Laden ran to. Okay? Rough country. Even where billy goats feared to tread. Feared to tread. This mountainous area was hardly ever conquered by any army. Even Alexander the Great had a hard time in this area. Can't catch him. Can't make it work. And we're picking up in the first missionary journey of the Apostle Paul while he and Barnabas were in Antioch, Pisidia, not to be confused with Antioch, Syria, where they were sent out. In Acts chapter 13, verse 14, if you would there, but when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch and Pisidia, and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if ye have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. So they went to the Jewish synagogue. And now being recognized as religious, religious leaders, they were asked if they have something they believe that God would have them say to do that, to say on. Paul was highly, highly trained by a famous Jew, a rabbi, Gamaliel. And likely Paul was still wearing uh, the robes which would identify him even with the sect of the Pharisees for which he was trained. It's much like what someone would do when they're identifying with different markings on their uniform or lapel pin or whatever the case may be. And so he would be identified by these distinctive things as a Pharisee of Pharisees, a high learned man, a scholar is among them. And so if the rabbi wished he could call upon any of those who would be most definitely qualified to speak. So Paul was recognized by the elders there in the synagogue and being he was a teacher, the visiting rabbi, he was to speak. And here we find one of the best sermons ever delivered. It did not include a joke and a poem. But it still was one of the best sermons ever delivered. Paul commanded them to listen. And it's urgent that we learn how to listen to the right people. And if there ever was a time, I ask you, and ask you visitors, if there ever was a time that you need discernment to know who you need to listen to, is it not today? We have so many people clamoring for our attention. You can't go anywhere and do anything without somebody trying to communicate something to you. And mostly it's to get into your wallet. Everywhere you go, everybody's trying to get into your mind. If there ever was a time, there was so much confusion that we need to learn how to focus and listen to the right one, it's now. You realize your children and grandchildren, great-grandchildren are confused. Their confusion is off the charts. They don't know who to listen to. TikTok or you. They have been indoctrinated not to trust their parents. Definitely don't trust your grandparents. They're old and washed up. Don't trust them. Certainly don't trust the Bible. No. That's to be laid aside and we're doing that faster than even some communist countries do it. Beware. We better learn how to pay attention to the right thing. And Paul commanded them to listen. Because what he was about to share with them was the most important 
message they would ever hear. More important than, hey, by the way, your taxes are going down. Didn't you hear? Well, not really. How about, uh, were you going to have a baby? We like that news, but uh, this is more important than that. Well, you want a new car? Well, better than that. Or how about, well, you're going to Disney Woke World. Hmm. More than the Marines are here, this message is the most important message of all time. And that's why it's known as the gospel, meaning good news. Good news. The bad news is we are sinners. The good news is Jesus came to give life to sinners. The good news. So here we find, beginning in verse 16, Then Paul stood up and beckoned with his hand and said, Ye men of Israel and ye that fear God, give audience. Now obviously you know who the men of Israel are. That's the, the male Jews that were present. But he also, ye that fear God. There's a question. Do you fear God? If you do and you have the good sense to fear God, the creator of all that is, then pay attention. This is important. That's what he's saying. Pay attention. This is important. The God of this people of Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelled as strangers in the land of Egypt. And with a high arm brought he them out of it. And about the time of forty years suffered he their manners in the wilderness. And when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan. Now we just read this as history, but these are real events. He divided their land to them by lot. And after that he gave unto them judges about the space of 450 years until Samuel the prophet. And afterward they desired a king and God gave, them, gave unto them Saul the son of Sis, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, tall good looking man, by the space of 40 years. And when he had removed him he raised up unto them David to be their king. To whom also he gave testimony and said, I found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Of this man's seed hath God, according <coughs> to his promise, raised unto Israel a Savior, Jesus. Now let's turn aside just for a second to recognize, years later in the timeline that's being presented by Paul here, what he's doing is giving a historical sketch of where are we in time past, and where are we going to come to now? And what's the decision that you and I need to be making based upon these historical facts? So years later in the timeline, of course, presented by Paul, an announcement would be given to a virgin, a virgin, not a young maiden, there's a difference, a virgin named Mary. In Luke chapter 1 verse 30, And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. Just as prophesied earlier. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Now back at the ranch, back in chapter 13 of Acts, we begin again and continue on in verse 24. When John had first preached before his coming the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. What, who's that John? That's John the Baptist. And as John fulfilled his course, he said, Whom think ye that I am? I am not he. But behold, there cometh one after me whose shoes of his feet I am not worthy to loose. Another way we would say this, I'm not worthy to polish his boots. Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you that feareth God. So the message is not only to the Jews, but to all Gentiles, all people who would fear God. To you is the word of this salvation sent, and it's still being sent to you even this very morn. For they that dwelt at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voices of the prophets which were read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. In other words, not even knowing what they're doing, they fulfilled the prophecies. 
And though they found no cause of death in him, yet desired they Pilate that he should be slain. In other words, they knew he was innocent. They knew he was innocent. They knew he was innocent. And they had him murdered. Seems like a trend, doesn't it? Verse 29. And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher in a grave. But God raised him from the dead. And he was seen many days of them which came up with him from Galilee. People say, well, that's just the story. Well, it's a story verified by hundreds and hundreds of people who turned the world upside down. In a very militant, unfriendly environment called the Roman Empire. This is no story. This is the truth. God raised from the dead, verse 31. He was seen many days of them which came up from him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people. And we declare unto you glad tidings, that's the good news, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, the prophecies, God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, and that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm, in their psalm book. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption. And the word shall not rot in the grave. He said to this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Wherefore he saith also in another, in another psalm, psalm, Thou shalt not suffer thy holy one to see corruption. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep. And was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. David's body died and he rotted, the body rotted in the grave. But he whom God raised up saw no corruption. Be it known unto you therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. Amen. This one who did not see corruption, this one who died for your sins and was buried did not see corruption, rose from the dead. So that you could be forgiven. And I could be forgiven. My wicked sins. All of them. All of them. All of them. By him all that believed. Verse 39. Are justified from all things. Which, from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Beware therefore, beware, lest that come upon you which is spoken of in the prophets. Behold ye despisers, and wonder, and perish. For I work a work in your days, a work which ye shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. So the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, it has a historical context. And it began long before His incarnation. Just the word meaning when he became flesh, the enfleshment of the Lord. We call it the first Noel, the first Christmas, the first Christmas. Long before Mary was notified about the son who would be born to her of the Holy Spirit, God was already engaged in human affairs. Why has God always been engaged in human affairs? Well, one, God created human beings. You may have learned that you came from a slug bug or a monkey. But I'm here to tell you that's not what God's Word says. God's Word says you were made in the image of God through Adam. God created us. Prophesied in ancient times all the way back to Genesis 3. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Go over to Isaiah chapter 53. I've been in Isaiah quite a bit of late, and that's a good thing, especially pertaining to our Lord. Isaiah chapter 53, years after, of course, Genesis 3, in his story, history is about his story. We have a bunch of revisionists going on this day. 
but history is about his story. So years later, the prophet Isaiah said this, beginning in verse 2 of Isaiah 53. Are you there yet? Say amen. amen. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of the dry ground. He hath no form or, nor comeliness. When we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. In other words, he's not your Hollywood version. He's not your Hollywood version. It was, he was not about looks. He's about doing the work of God. He was despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. That's our sins. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. Could I ask you to look up here just a second? That means you. That means me. That means your mother and father, your children. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Again, verse 6, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He was no whiner. Man, could I tell you, he was the best man that ever walked this planet. He was the strongest man that ever walked this planet. He was the God man. He set his face like flint to the cross. He was taken, verse 8, from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence. Neither was any deceit in his mouth. No trickery any time, any kind. Truly, truly God in the flesh. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin... He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul. Whose soul? God the Father sees the travail, the agony of his son, Jesus Christ, and shall be satisfied. So the prophecy of the prophets saying when this takes place a year later on the cross of Calvary, the Father is going to see the agony of his son. And be satisfied that holiness and justice has been met. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. He bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. You're looking at a preacher who believes the Bible is a supernatural book. I believe the Bible is God's holy word. From cover to cover. God's holy book. It is a supernaturally inspired work of God. And it tells us about a supernatural Savior. Number one, it tells us of a supernatural birth. No one was ever born like him. His birth was prophesied again all the way back to Genesis 3, 15. Isaiah 7, 14 says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive. That's never happened before. A virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means, by the way, God with us. God with us. It tells number two, not only about a supernatural birth, but a supernatural life. Jesus was the only man that ever walked this planet to never sin.
Can you say that? Can you say, I've honestly never told a lie? Can you honestly say, I've never taken something that did not belong to me? Not one of us can. But Jesus never sinned. 1 John 1, 5 says, Then this is the message which we heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all, not even darkness. 3, 5 says, And you know that he was manifested to take away our sin, in him is no sin. No sin. Regardless of what Hollywood has to say, of course, of course, regardless of what Hollywood has to say. Hollywood is not inspired of anything but likely the devil. The supernatural book tells us, number three, he died a substitutionary death. He did not die for crimes he committed. He died for the crimes you and I committed. That makes us worthy of death. So he died in your place. He died in your place. He died in my place. He died in my place. Did he die in your father's place? He died in your father's place. For your father's sins. For your sin. For my sin. The Bible says again, he was manifest to take away our sin. By the way, he's the only man capable and qualified to die for your sin. Listen, I could die for you as a patriot. I could die for you as a Christian martyr. But my death would never pay for your sin. Never. Why? Because I too, sir, I'm, I'm also a sinner. Jesus is God's eternal son from eternity past. And Jesus died for your sin. He died for my sin. As in my place. In my place. Paul wrote to the church at Corinth that he says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So when I got saved, when I became a Christian at age eight years old, by trusting the simple gospel of Jesus. There was a divine swap that took place. God through his son took all my sin. And I received the righteousness of Jesus in return. The divine miracle of justification. While thousands of lambs pass over. Or thousands of lambs were being sacrificed. And it was thousands upon thousands in Jerusalem. And if there was an altar and a temple in Jerusalem today, you'd see it today. While thousands of lambs were being sacrificed on the altar at the temple, blood stained the mountain of God. Blood would be running so many thousands and thousands of lambs. The real Lamb of God that John the Baptist identified when he came to fulfill righteousness. Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. That lamb would be butchered. We were at the Passion Play in Glen Rose Friday night. And Brother John, good man, Flores, he says some of that was hard to take. Now that's all acting. Are you with me? That's all acting. Most of us would run from the scene if we just saw a glimpse of what actually took place. Nobody would be joking. Nobody. Even the hardest of men would be moved to mercy, mercy upon this man. They beat him beyond human recognition. Bruised and bloody. The Lamb of God was destined for this to take away our sin. This is not some little Hollywood story. This is real. The Lamb slain, the Bible says, slain 
for us. Of course, he's our Passover. At, after the show the other night, they had the curtain call. You know, everybody comes out and do a little bows and stuff. The ladies said, boy, they had some good girls up there. And the guy, you know, they had the, the, the Sanhedrin, the, the Pharisees up there. They come up there with all their stuff. And I want to say, boo, 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 boo. You know, just, uh, you know, they're bad people. They're bad. I know they're, they're all in doing it for acting for the Lord, you know, but they're bad people. And then I walked right by Pilate. I know Pilate. I walked right by Pilate and I thumped him on the chest like that and I said, you're a bad man. You're a bad man. You did a good job, but you're a bad man. Even Pilate, now get this, this puppet of Caesar, come on, this puppet of Caesar, politician. You think we got bad politicians today? You know nothing. Study the Roman Empire. This politician knew and declared, this is an innocent man. There's no fault in him. So, you know, what's the old adage, you know, find a man and, and, and find a crime? There's no crime. This is an innocent man. This is a good man. This is a great man. In John chapter 19, he says, Behold, I bring him forth to you that ye may know that I find no fault in him. No fault in him. It's not some would-be, fly-by-night, flim-flam artist that manipulated some crowds. This is the man who raised the dead. This is the man who made boys, now grown men, who were born blind to see. This is the man that proved himself with many miracles before the people. So that they gave their life. And many of them were brutally tortured but would not deny that they knew him and believed him, believed in him. That's why Christianity is what it is today. It certainly has nothing to do with pop Christianity today. That if it's not cool to be a Christian, we're out. I'm not finished yet. The supernatural book tells us that after he died for our sins, he was buried that on the third day he rose from the dead. He rose from the dead. I'm sorry, but if you have a, an emblem of Jesus on a cross, you ought to take it off. Because Jesus is not on the cross any longer. John 21 the first day of the week, that's why we come to church on Sunday and celebrate Jesus, worship on Sunday. First day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark into the sepulcher and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. The stone was removed. Matthew 28, we find the angel answered and said to the women, Fear not ye. Now why would you? You'd be afraid too. Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. It's what I received this, this morning, early this morning, a message from one of my elders. Preachers. He is risen. Changes the world. It changes the world. He is risen. He is risen. He's not in the grave. He's risen. Supernatural power. Supernatural power. We know he sent it back to be with the Father and to be our go-between, our mediator. Hebrews 7.25 says, Seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. That's why I'm secure. It's because Jesus is interceding for me. He's on my side. He's bearing out my case through his work. Now, why did he do this? Well, he did this to offer men, women, boys, and girls salvation. Salvation. Who can forgive you of your sins but God? No one. But God can. 
He did all of these things not to impress us. He did all these things not that he could sell books or trinkets in the marketplace or on Facebook. He hung in shame for our sin. He suffered. He suffered and died. Not just died. They didn't stick a needle in his arm and he just went to sleep. He suffered and died. His body was torn to shreds so that many people who went through such beatings never made it to a crucifixion. The spear in his side, that was for you and me. The nails in his hand, hands and the nails in his feet, that was for you. The crown of thorns, that's for you, that's for me. Being there all alone when he cried out unto his heavenly Father, who he had had perfect unity with since eternity past. Then when he took upon himself our sin, the Holy Father, not able to look upon sin, turned his back on his son. And instantly, God's son, the strongest man to ever walk this planet cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Me, your son, me, the one who's known you and have been one with you for all of this time, eternity past. But it had to be. Why? Your sin. My sin. My soteriology, by the way, includes the good news that Jesus loves all people. For God so loved the world. That's you. That's all people. Red, yellow, black, and white, they're all precious in His sight. My soteriology includes the good news that Jesus loves all people. And that he's not willing that any person should perish. Not one. None of this any, many, mighty, mo, you to heaven and hell, you go. I don't believe it. I believe your theology needs to include things just as simple as not God's will that any should perish. I mean, God wants you to be saved. God wants you to accept his son, that sacrifice that Jesus paid on that cross. He wants you to accept that sacrifice. If you do not accept it, it is not because Jesus doesn't want you to accept it. He wants you to accept the gift of eternal life. But you can't be swept in. Somebody says, well, I'm in America. I have dollar bills. It says, in God we trust. That's not going to sweep you into heaven. So he says, well, my granddaddy was a preacher. That's not going to sweep you into heaven. Well, my grandmother, bless her heart, bless her memory. She's a fine Christian woman. Well, that's not going to sweep you into heaven. I was talking to one of the staff the other day about sometimes music groups, how they come, and next thing you know, they're spewing out heresy. You know, they're, sometimes those guys are not the best trained in the word. You know what I mean? I said, you know what I mean? I said, you know what I mean? And so he gets up here years ago, even in our own church, you know, and his mother, poor mother, she'd passed away. She was a Christian woman. And she's in heaven. But he's telling this story and he's, you know, talking to his mama before she passed away. And, oh, mama, you know, when you get to heaven, mama, make, be sure to make a hole big enough for me to get in when I get there. Huh? Huh? Well, it sounds so sweet. It's just wrong. No sinner makes a way for anybody to go to heaven. No matter if there's somebody's sweet mother or not. Only Jesus makes a way for heaven. You've got to accept Jesus, though, as a gift. You say, well, I want to pay for it. You don't have enough money. Well, I want to purchase it by being good. Your works of righteousness are even filthy to God. There's nothing you have to give to God to earn salvation. 
You say, I'll be the best man that ever walked this planet from, from now on. You're still not worthy. The only way you can be worthy is by receiving the gift of forgiveness by Jesus. You have to accept it as a gift. Even if you go to a football games, I guess they still have them around, unless the woke crowd has woke them up, you know. T-shirts, banners, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Gift. Gift. A gift. By the way, a lot of people are taking off denominational names off of their churches, and I think if they're ashamed of their heritage, they probably ought to. Did I say that? Yeah, I guess I did. I said if they're ashamed of their heritage, they probably ought to. Well, obviously I'm not. New Heights Baptist Church. We wouldn't be having religious freedom if it were not for Baptists. Do you even know that as an American? Do you even know that? Many do not. There is not a Baptist plan of salvation. There's not a Methodist plan of salvation. Even if they won't put their name still on the sign because they're trying to hide the fact that they're Methodist. A man down the street. And I said, well, what are you? And he says, well, we're, we're, we're a church. And I said, I know that. Church just means assembly. What kind are you? Well, you know, uh, well, if you have to know, well, I'm asking. Well, we are affiliated with the church of God. I said, then why not say that? Deception. When you go to Walmart, at least you know you're going to Walmart, not just the store. When you're going to Target, at least you know you're going to Target. But now it's just Sandcastle Church. What in the world does that mean? That means you're ashamed to tell us what you really believe. I might not get a shot again at some of you guys, so I might as well throw it down, you know. <laughs> I've got a name. My name's Foster. Steve. My dad would say Stephen Benjamin Nothead Foster. But you know me by my name. And you know us by our name. This has nothing to do with the message, but I think you need to know it anyway. A lot of people want to say, there are many ways to heaven. No, there are not. Just one. You say, that's pretty narrow. Yep, about this narrow right here. The Bible says in the book of Acts, there's none other name given among men whereby we must be saved. If you're going to be saved, if you're going to go to heaven, it's because you've accepted Jesus Christ by the gift, the payment he paid on the Roman cross. And if you don't accept that gift, you're not going to heaven. I don't care how many conferences you attend and how many books you buy and how many people give you any trinkets to prove otherwise. You're not going to heaven except you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Your personal Savior. Two more and I'm done. Well, I'm not going to preach tonight because we're not having service, so I'm going to get you these other two. Number, number six. Christ supernaturally ascended back into the clouds to be with the Father to ever intercede for us. Hebrews 7.25, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for us. And then number seven, Christ supernaturally one day is coming back. Now he's coming back before he comes back for good. He's coming back to take his children, his church out. We call that the rapture. The rapture. He went in the clouds and he's going to come back in the clouds and he's going to stop right up yonder. Well, right up yonder. Yeah, that way, to the east. He's going to stop up there. And the trump of God's going to sound. And every one of your dead ancestors, family and friends and neighbors, who knew Jesus Christ and the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ, 
They're going to, their bodies are going to come up out of the grave. Amen. It's not going to be a decayed body. It's going to be a new body gifted to them by the Lord. Amen. A glorified body that will never, ever taste death again. You think that's going to get CNN's attention? <laughs> Maybe some guys over at Fox News. The rapture is when Jesus is going to come again and take us out. The Lord says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you some. Well, I don't believe. That's the King James mansions. Well, if you want a sloppy house, you read your own version. <laughs> Paul wrote, I would not have you to be ignorant. We have more information today than humanity's ever had. But we have more ignorance than we've ever had. It's amazing, but it's true. Paul said, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, who have physically died, that you snarl not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. And this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. In other words, we're not going to get out in front of them. They get to go first. Those rays get to go first. For the Lord himself shall ascend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. And it's the best I can do. Sorry. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. You say, well, the dead in Christ is going to rise. Yeah, he rose first. He proved he could. Well, he proved he could. Where's his body? Where's his body? He's risen. He's not here. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together. It's where we get the term rapture. Caught up together with them in the clouds. You like to fly? One day I'm going to fly so fast, faster than a speeding bullet. To meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. The question is, will you be one of the wise to hear and heed the gospel message? Or will you just dismiss it? I cannot make that decision for you. I can tell you, I have made the decision. And I believe. I believe. And I believe, my Lord, the same Lord who gave sight to the blind and raised the dead and rose from the dead. If I happen not to be one of those ones who are alive and remain and one day this church oversees the throwing of dirt in my face and buries my body. I believe just as sure as there's a sun and a moon. I will rise again. Amen. Not by my power, not by my strength, but by the strength and power of our blessed Lord. Do you know that? If not, why? You say, is it possible to live with such confidence? Here I am. <laughs> yes. And many others. Many, many others. I know whom I have believed. I know. Do you know? Do you know? You say, well, there's so much corruption and so many people, trickery and all going on. Yeah, we live in a fallen world. Yeah, I get it. Churches, yeah, I get it. I get it. But that doesn't disqualify the Lord. So I just keep following Him and doing my best. Somebody said, well, the church is so full of hypocrites. We'll move over and make room for one more. <laughs> Let's stand.
Lord of heaven, those of us who know you by faith, those of us who are your children, forgive us for not appreciating the great sacrifice that you made on the cross of Calvary for our sin. And forgive us of not living a life of appreciation as we should. Now, Lord, those who are here in this holy place and perhaps have never put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, Lord, I pray today they would see the historical evidence of the fact that Jesus was God's Son who died on the cross of Calvary for the sins of the world. And that means their sin. And Lord, I would ask them today to put their faith and trust in Jesus and call upon Him to be saved. Perhaps come forward and just say, Preacher, I'd like to receive the gift of eternal life. I'd like to know that my sins are forgiven. I ask them, Lord, to come and allow us to take the Holy Word of God and share with them the good news of Jesus. So bless us, Lord, this day. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Page 257 has our song of invitation. This is the time of service where we invite you to respond to the Lord in prayer as we sing softly and tenderly. Page 257 in your hymnals. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. Thank you so much, guests and visitors, for being here with us this morning. I also want to say thank you for uh, everybody that's been praying for me the last couple of weeks with my recovery from surgery. I appreciate all the prayers. We do have a little Easter egg hunt for all the kids right after uh, the service out at the playground back here. So all moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas, make sure you get out there and uh, see the, all the kids and everything, get the Easter eggs. It's going to be a fun time. All right, let's go ahead and be dismissed in prayer. Again, no service tonight, so we will see you next week. Let's be dismissed in prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for your word preached this morning. Thank you for pastor presenting the message from the word. Lord, we thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for you who died on the cross for our sins. But Lord, we know you didn't stay there and you rose again from the dead, proving that you are in fact the almighty God. Lord, we thank you for everything you do for us and everything that you continue to do for us, the grace and mercy that you extend towards us. Bless us this day. Be with be with us as we go forth. Help us to spread your word and tell everybody else the good news that you are risen indeed. We thank you and praise you for everything you do. It's in Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen.